On today's episode of What to Ship, we have some updates to some previous stories. We look across the different sectors of the shipping market, containers, LNG, the bulk, and oil trade. And we look at a story of how India is looking to ban vessels older than 25 years. Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCogliano. Welcome to today's episode. So we're going to recap all the big stories that have gone on over the past week. As always, a lot going on on the global shipping market. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's take a look at some past stories real quick because we got some updates I want to share with you. So last week I did a couple of stories that dealt more on a naval and military side. One of the stories I did was a piece on the one-year anniversary of war on the Black Sea. And I just wanted to follow that up because one of the things I did was write an article. It's posted over on G Captain, and I'll have the link in the show notes down below so you can go see it, talking a little bit more in detail about that war on the Black Sea as it enters its second year. I think we're really at an inflection point going forward, and the question is, what happens on that conflict? Does it continue with Ukraine being able to export its grain and Russia being able to export its food, fuel, and fertilizer? And what are some danger dangerous pitfalls that could materialize over the next year. Second, did this story on the Marine Corps' light amphibious warship, or what they're calling the landing ship medium. And this has garnered quite a a bit of attention on a couple of matters. John Conrad over G-Captain wrote this piece about the U.S. Marine Corps and their experiments offshore. Over at Maritime Executive, this story about a new class, very similar to what the Marine Corps want to build, that the U.S. Army is designing, which could actually outclass what the Marine Corps want to build, which raises the question of why is the Army and Marine Corps pursuing separate vessels that have similar capabilities? And then finally, this story, which goes in some detail about that offshore support vessel, the HOS Dominator, that I discussed in the video. Here's some more specific details about it from maritime executive that discusses them in in a bit more detail. But I think the most amazing thing about the story was this. In my video, I talked about the fact that the Marine Corps wasn't letting out a lot of information. There's a lot of questions about the program. And I said, if the Marine Corps wants to come on and talk about it, I'd be glad to host them. Well, they took me up on the offer. I got a note from the Marine Corps Developmental Lab saying they would love to come on and talk about it. So I'm in the process of setting that up. Uh, Hope to have it up in about a week or two, depending on when we can schedule it and get it done. We're really waiting for the budget process to finish up, too. Uh, Good buddy of mine, Chris Cavas, made made that really important note that, you know, wait till March 9th till after the appropriations are done so that we know what's going to be built and when. And so working on scheduling that right now just to show the influence that what's going on with shipping has, thanks to you, the viewers and subscribers, we've got the U.S. Marine Corps coming on to talk about a subject that I mentioned on the YouTube channel, which I find absolutely fantastic. Great. It's wonderful. I I don't know what to say about it. It's just, it's amazing, but it's largely due to you. So thank you for that. All right, let's go ahead and jump into story number one. Story number one is the container sector. And this week, the TPM conference hosted by the Journal of Commerce just wrapped up over in Long Beach. They hold this every year out in Long Beach. And uh, I was hoping to be able to get out to it. I was hoping for an invite, but the Journal of Commerce did not invite me out to participate in it. I I was hoping so. And I I, I should mention something. So the sites I use on this channel and I reference for you are all open source. In other words, you don't need a subscription to do it. I don't typically put some other sources on here like Journal of Commerce, uh, Trade Winds, and uh, Lloyd's because you have to pay for those. And while I'll read them and I have subscriptions to them and I read their pieces. I don't like referencing their pieces if you can't get to them. And I, I again, I think that's just uh, part of the nature. Those journals are really geared toward the consumers and, and the uh, shippers and the carriers, uh, not so much open source media type as the ones I have on here, FreightWaves, G-Captain, Uh, Lodestar, Container News, uh, uh, Sea Trade, Splash 24-7, Maritime Executive. So 
just to give you that background, because it does come up every now and then. And I get some flack every now and then from some of the uh, news outlets that I don't feature on here. But again, I don't want to feature a story where you're going to be able to read the first three lines and that's it. And you're not be able to go in there without a substantial uh, subscription to those pages. Anyway, the container shipping. So the tables have turned at TPM 2023. This is a Lodestar story. Uh, Mike Wackett was over in Long Beach and he talked about it, how a year ago you had ships waiting off Long Beach and now basically they're gone. The fees are down. And he says just 12 months later, the annual TPM conference at Long Beach gets in the gear. There are very few container ships that can be seen in San Pedro. The rates are down to $1,500 per box. Uh, uh, TPM is a huge conference, massive. Everyone is a who's who in the shipping industry. Really hate. I can't go there, but you know, got to freaking teach. I uh, got my other full-time job I got to do. But it was definitely an interesting one because, again, what we're talking about here is how the shipping industry is undergoing its changes. And one of the things I want to show you is a series of stories here that kind of highlight this. So right here, CMA CGM, one of the big ocean carriers, sees container shipping slow down continuing in 2023. So we're seeing that slow down in the amount of ocean freight. Not surprising coming off the record year that was 2022. Trans-Pacific Ocean carriers hope to regain trust of shippers burned during pandemic supercycle. Man, there are a lot of people who were trying to ship cargo who had shipped for a long time with certain ocean carriers, and they got screwed by the ocean carriers because the ocean carriers saw an opportunity for record profits, and sometimes they put their long-term clients to the side. And what that has done is shifted a lot of shippers to go to different ocean carriers. And now you're trying to rebuild that trust and reliability. It's a big issue in the shipping industry. Even though there's not that many shippers out there, the ones that are out there, there is some competition still out there. Hopog Lloyd marked the 175th year with record profit, but see significant decline inevitable in 2023. Uh, that is a big issue. Everyone's going to see this. And the question is, what do the ocean carriers drunk on profits now do when things slow down? Do we start seeing realignments? Lars Jensen gave a talk at TPM, which I would have given my, you know, a lot to go see because Lars to me is, is one of the most uh, influential people and reads the shipping market better than anyone, particularly containers. And he started talking about the fact that some ocean carriers may be looking at alignment, Evergreen and Yangmin, for example. And do we see combinations of ocean carriers start to happen? Uh, it's going to be interesting. Hop Hog and ONE, for example. Uh, I don't know. That's going to be a really interesting thing to see what eventually happens. Do we see some more of the alliances begin to break up the alliance and the ocean alliance? Idle container ships gathering near China signal bet on demand recovery. We're seeing vessels being idled. And, and a lot of this also has to do with the phase out of older tonnage and the shift to newer, more uh, robust tonnage that can carry more containers and be swung onto different routes. And so, but one of the readings that's coming from this is that we're expecting to see China and East Asia kick back up into gear here after the decline that always happens in February. Always. Look at the past five years. Always happens in February. And are we going to see a kick up in this? This story, supply chain disruptions impact on inflation is likely to persist despite recovery. One of the big things that we talked about for inflation during the height of the supply chain crisis was the increased freight rates were fueling the inflation, that it was costing more to ship goods. And it wasn't just ocean shipping, it was land shipping, it was warehousing, it was rail, it was truck, it was everything. But as shipping costs increase, we're seeing that. And remember, even though the Trans-Pacific rates have dropped to pre-pandemic levels, the Ocean rates to Europe and from Europe to the North America are still above pre-pandemic levels. And that's where the majority of the cargo is going because of that issue of reliability and the whole discussion I had about the port of L.A. and Long Beach in a previous video here. Container liners still chartering ships despite drop in cargo demand. This is uh, Greg Miller always going in some great detail here, and he's talking about some of these big carriers like Global Shipping Lines and other lessers that are basically uh, uh, handling ships. So he talked about Global Ship Lease uh, and the peaks they have, talking about all those companies that are building new containers, have new containers, and leasing them out. Remember, if you lease a container ship to an ocean carrier and they don't use it, you still get paid. And so there are long-term leases 
out there. And what we're going to start seeing is what happens with the renewals and the new ships as they start to come online. Very interesting story by Greg Miller. And then two stories dealing directly with the United States, which I found really interesting in the container sector. One, this one here from Bloomberg, Biden supply chain envoy says automating ports doesn't have to cost jobs. This is the issue going on with the West Coast uh, renegotiation uh, between the Pacific Maritime Association and the International Warehouse Labor Union. I think we're eventually going to see U.S. government intervention into this. And I think this statement here by um, uh, Steve Lyons is an indicator for me that we're starting to see that in many ways. Uh, Marty Welsh, the outgoing Secretary of Labor, would be the one I would expect. But now we're seeing Steve, Steve Lyons, the former commander of Transcom, U.S. Transportation Command taking a role in this. And then the most pitiful story of the week when it came to containers is this one. Mike Schiller wrote this story. The Maritime Administration announces more than $12 million in funding for the renamed U.S. Marine Highways Program. The U.S. Marine Highways Program is an attempt to create short sea shipping. That is coast-to-coast -coast shipping, inland waterway shipping. And the fact that we're posting a story about the fact that the U.S. government is awarding $12 million, which is nothing. Let me be clear. This is chump change. I can think of a lot better things to fund $12 million for than this. Give me $12 million and I'll do more for U.S. maritime shipping than this will ever do. I'll get the news out there. I'll create a, 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 a study group and a think tank that will put Cato to shame and talk about what we should be doing and formulating policies and plans for really resumption and preventing what we just saw happen. Where is the initiative to prevent the supply chain crisis that happened? Because understand, that supply chain crisis can happen again tomorrow. We've done very little to mitigate it. And a lot of people are sitting there saying, just leave it alone. It's fine. The system works. That was a once in a hundred year aberration. But <laughs> I, I, the way things are going right now, I would not ever bank on that. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number two. Story number two deals with the LNG sector. This story from Reuters, Biden administration looks to clean up natural gas supply chain as U.S. vies for top LNG spot. So this is a really interesting story from Reuters talking about issues with liquefied natural gas shipments. And I just want to read the introduction here. So the Biden administration is holding talks with global energy companies and foreign officials in an effort to set standards for certified natural gas, a form of fuel that producers market as climate friendly. The effort comes as the United States seeks to sustain its LNG exports to Europe uh, to displace Russian fuel. Uh, a credible market for certified natural gas could help it tackle both goals at once. Gas can be certified as low to no carbon if it produce, producers can prove they've reduced greenhouse gas emissions associated with getting it to market, or they purchase carbon offsets to cut its net climate impact. It's a big pri priority for us to make sure that role we're playing in supplying natural gas to our allies at a time of great energy security need is done in a way that is climate responsible. The U.S. has become the world's top gas producer in recent years. Okay, the problem with that whole statement is when you take natural gas and you liquefy it, you use a ton of energy to do it. You have got to cool it and cool it down to a level of minus 160 uh, degrees Celsius, about minus 240 Fahrenheit. You got to cool it down or almost minus 260 uh, Fahrenheit. You got to cool it down. That requires a huge amount of energy to do that. And you are actually producing carbon in this. Understand. And then you've got to regasify it when it gets to the other end. And that takes energy associated with it. So everyone who thinks liquefied natural gas is the end all be all here. It's clean. It's natural. It's, it's fantastic because it has natural in it. It's not natural gas, on the other hand, when you put natural gas in a pipeline, it's great. So that when, for example, everybody screams and yells about getting natural gas to New England and they talk about we need liquefied natural gas carriers to bring uh, natural gas up to uh, New England during the wintertime. Remember, the amount they use is equal to one shipload spread over several months. That can be all taken care of by a pipeline, and the pipeline is much more environmentally friendly than liquefying natural gas, hauling it on a ship, burning fuel to get it up there, and then having to offload it. And this is the big issue we're seeing right now with liquefied natural gas. Uh, and we're moving liquefied natural gas in larger and larger loads around the world. Then you have this story that piggybacks on this. U.S. LNG exports flat, 
even after the restart of the Freeport LNG facility. So if you remember, Freeport LNG had a huge explosion the other year, shut down the facility. It was the third largest export facility in the United States. And now what we're seeing is even with that restart, we're seeing it causing flat data right here. Uh, LNG was flat last month at 6.84 million tons. Shipping data showed on Tuesday, even as long, idled, long idled Texas processing facility began shipping the fuel during an ongoing restart. Remember, we are competing with LNG exports with Russia, with Australia, with Qatar. And so there is a lot of vying out there for what needs to be done when it comes to exporting LNG. We are also completely dependent on foreign ships for this and foreign companies because we have no domestic U.S. LNG carriers. And so those LNG carriers are going to go to wherever there's availability of LNG and wherever they can make the most profit. We do not have a assured shipment of LNG out of the United States because we don't have U.S. companies and U.S. flag vessels that do that where we can offset the cost in some ways to uh, incentivize shipping on U.S. vessels and consuming U.S. LNG, which I think is a big problem, something we need to be looking at. Shipping is not just for, na when we talk about the national security and national defense, it's not just hauling tanks and and, and, and you know, MREs around. It's also shipping our natural resources and ensuring we have a sh safe shipment of those natural resources. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number three. Story number three deals with the dry bulk sector. And this story over at Splash 24-7 is talking about how the geared dry bulk market's on fire. Okay, geared. These are vessels that can load and offload themselves. They don't need shore support to load. That's what we talk about when we talk about a geared vessel. And those are those big cranes you see right here on the front of them. And what you're seeing here is that marketplace is going. Uh, Supermax, especially geared ones, are hot property this week with rates the envy of all other bulk classes is strong demand and in both basins propel earnings, which means that the big Cape vessels, a lot of the vessels that do not have gear are not doing well. We just saw that Eagle uh, bulk shipping reported on its earnings and its EPS, its earnings per share was down, but its overall earnings overall was up, but that did not stop the stock from taking a huge dive from about $65 a share down to $55 a share, about a 15% drop of that stock. But again, what we're looking at here is across the bulk sector right now, because of the long distances associated with moving cargo around those ton miles, uh, we're seeing the bulk market being one of those sectors that is having a lot of positive movement. Now, there's also some issues with the bulk market. This story, which was a great story, uh, reading is about a Chinese bulk carrier that got damaged by ice off of Sakhalin Island in the Pacific. Uh, this vessel, which was the, and I forget the name, there he goes, Yang Zing, uh, Yang Zing's 56. Uh, looks like you're going to need Yang Zing 57 because Yang Zing 56 hit uh, ice. It actually got entrapped in the ice. Here's the image of it in the ice. Uh, you get the full imagery right there of it in the ice. Vessels are not, it's the ship did not hit an iceberg. This was not Titanic with, you know, Jack and Rose on board the vessel where, you know, you know, Rose kills Jack because she won't let him on the float at the end. Very clear. Watch the 25th anniversary of Titanic. Again, Rose kills Jack. Very clear. Uh, just let's be clear about that. Uh, this is a case where, sorry, we dug errors. Uh, this is a case where ice actually encumbers the vessel. It actually pushes in, and so the ship cannot get clear. Ships are usually, if they're operating in ice like this, have to be ice rated, have strengthened hulls. Obviously, this vessel did not. It took a hole in the forward hull. That's why on the previous picture you saw the, the hatch covers up on the forward hull. They were actually putting pumps in to pump it out. Uh, interesting image on this picture I don't quite understand is they dropped their lifeboat. So at one point the crew abandoned ship, but I don't think I would drop this lifeboat into ice. Uh, that would not be a nice way to uh, 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 drop this thing. These free fall lifeboats are, are, they're not designed for ice and they're sure not designed to be dropped into ice. Uh, you'll bash it up. So I'm not sure if they tried to lower it or if, they, or if they were lowering it here for launch later on themselves instead of letting it free fall and crashing. And maybe what they were doing is preparing it for launch. The vessel was uh, towed out into open water, but it succumbed to the flooding. These vessels, bulk vessels, are are very susceptible to flooding because of the cargo on board. Once you start adding water into them, either it's it's ore, which has space between it, which will fill up, or if it's grain, it swells. It is not a good mix for vessels. And so you saw this going out there. And I think one of the issues we're going to need to be watching for 
is more vessel sinkings. We saw a bulk vessel that got hit off of Gibraltar. That was a loss I reported on earlier uh, this year. Uh, but again, we need to keep an eye on because I have a feeling because of the nature of what's going on with global shipping right now, we may see a tick up in ocean accidents. All right, let's go to the next story. Next story is Russian tankers and oil tankers in general. Man, if you want to talk about the sector that's having the growth right now, it's in the tanker sector. And what we see is this Bloomberg story over in G-Captain. Russian oil exports prove resilient to full force of Western bans. Did a whole story on this the other day. And one of the things we're seeing is Russian crude, Russian diesel is still being exported at same, if not higher rates than it was previously. It's just not going to the EU and the G7. It's heading other places. And those longer distance mean that ships have to haul cargo longer distances, which means higher freight rates. It means more work for less ships out in the marketplace. And that means profits for ocean shipping companies involved in this trade. And one of the things we are seeing too, there was another story here that Russian oil may be being exported at higher levels than the price caps associated, either the crude oil or the diesel oil. And that has to do with the fact that Russia is going out and finding P&I clubs, protection and indemnity clubs. These are the, the insurance groups that insure the cargo that are not meeting the requirements set forth by the EU and the G7 of price caps. Remember, the way the EU and the G7 hoped to hurt Russia was to make them ship oil and diesel below a, th a threshold, a price cap, but they did not want to stop the flow of oil and diesel for fear of the disruption that would have on the world economy. So they wanted the best of both worlds. They wanted Russian oil and diesel flowing, but they wanted to hurt Russia economically. Well, it seems like the demand is still up for Russian oil and diesel, and they may be making money now more than they were in the past. There's a lot of questions about this in how this is playing out. Go on over here to uh, our next story. This is from Greg Miller over at Freight Waves, the rise of crude tanker cannibals in the wake of Russia-Ukraine war. Crude tanker trade from the U.S. Gulf sees major change since the invasion. So VLCCs, very large crude carriers, cannibalized the transatlantic trade. Prior to the war, U.S. crude exports to Europe was loaded aboard Aframaxes. These are vessels with a capacity of about 750,000 barrels. And Suez Maxes, these are vessels with about a million uh, barrels. U.S. crude exports to Asia were loaded up, up on very large crude carriers. These are about 2 million barrel vessels. Well, now since Europe hiked its crude imports from the U.S. in the wake of the invasion, we're seeing VLCCs being used on the transatlantic trade. They're not going to Asia or Africa. They're going across to Europe, something you don't typically see of these very large crude carriers being used in this trade. And as uh, Greg notes here, VLCC is now the world's lar largest shuttle tankers. And you're also seeing what's called reverse lightering in the U.S. Gulf. One of the things you saw in the U.S. Gulf was these very large carriers would come in, these very large crude carriers. Again, the U.S. has to import certain types of crude oil because our refineries can't refine this, the crude we pull out of our ground. We have this weird scenario where we pull crude oil out of the ground in the United States, but we don't have the refinery capacity, so we export it, and then we import crude oil into the United States because that's the type of crude, which we largely got from Russia for a long time, into our refineries. And what would happen is you'd bring these very large crude carriers into the Gulf of Mexico. They were too big to come in U.S. ports. And so you would do a lighterage operation, what we call ship-to-ship -ship transfers, thing we're talking about. Well, now what we're seeing is a lightering operation taking place in the Gulf of Mexico. But in this case, U.S. crude is going in on smaller vessels and feeding into these large uh, VLCCs. It's a, it flips the market on its head. It's just something you never expected to see. And Sam uh, Chambers over at Splash 24-7 builds on that with his story. Big ones on the move. VLCC Armada takes record volumes of U.S. crude ex exports. I'll raise one other issue here, really important to know. Uh, for a long time, you couldn't export certain U.S. crude, particularly at Alaskan crude. And now you can, but there's an issue looming on the horizon that we are not building any new tankers in the United States. There's none being built. We haven't built a tanker in the United States for almost a decade now. And what happens when those tankers meet their end of year, you know, they're basically they're obsolete. They, they're, they're 30 years of operation and you can't use them anymore. 
Uh, if you're not building replacement tankers, then, for example, to haul Alaskan crude down the California, you need a Jones Act vessel. If you do not have a Jones Act vessel to do that, then all that Alaskan crude is going to go overseas because that's the only marketplace for it. And that's going to be a huge problem when you see that industry disappear. That's going to cause massive problems. So, all right, let's go ahead and jump over to our last story for the day. This is a story from Reuters over in GCAM, which I found really interesting. We, we saw this coming out, and I mentioned it previously, but this story talks about what India is doing. So India has banned all oil tankers and bulk carriers older than 25 years. Uh, there is not a set service life for vessels. It's basically a point of diminishing return. Uh, what you basically do is you run a vessel until it gets too uneconomical to operate anymore. Then you usually either put it on the market to sell as a secondhand vessel or you sell it for scrap, for recycling. And one of the things that we've seen is that in the tanker market right now, and we talked about this in previous What the Ships, is the Russian shadow fleet, these fleet of vessels that are hauling Russian oil. A lot of older tonnage is now being cycled into that Russian tanker fleet. These are ships that should be basically being scrapped, you know, beached in Bangladesh, in India, in Pakistan, in Turkey, and being recycled. However, now they're going into the shadow fleet and they're being insured through very questionable insurance companies and, and other entities. And India is basically concerned, and India has a right to be concerned because they saw recently an example of what happens when a ship is lost and the impact it can have off the coast of Sri Lanka with the Express Pearl. And so what India wants to do is make sure they don't receive these vessels because these vessels are more susceptible to pollution, to uh, hazards. If you look at dangers to vessels and ship accidents, the older the vessel, the more likely they are to have an accident. So India is banning vessels older than 25 years. This is going to either push these vessels into other trades or force a new building of oil tankers and uh, bulk carriers around the world, which is not happening right now. And understand, it is expensive to build these vessels. I know people will scream about, well, in the U.S., it's this many. I'm talking worldwide. Japan, China, and Korea are increasing costs to build vessels. Because there's less and less builders around the world, we've seen the number of shipyards decrease by 40% since 2009. It is getting more expensive to build replacement vessels. And if you look at the review of marine transport, the world fleet is getting older and the number of new build vessels is going down. And so is the number of shipyards. It's just getting more expensive. And that means more inflation in ship transportation costs, ship movement, and we are localizing, we're, we're concentrating where ship construction is. Remember right now, China builds about 47% of the world's ships. China, Korea, Japan together build 94%. So China builds more than Japan and Korea combined. Japan's losing its share. And so you may be in a situation where you're just dealing with China and Korea, for example, building ships on the world marketplace. Two countries that do not get along. Uh, you're talking about South Korea, who has an enemy to the north that creates a lot of problems for them. Uh, this is not a region of the world where, you know, within a thousand mile circle, you want 90 four percent of the world shipbuilding concentrated and this just really escalates the potential for danger of accidents on board ships in the world ocean trade <sighs> a lot going on there i hope you enjoyed today's what the ship our weekly news show that talks about the uh, kind of big huge recap in the week in global shipping Sure, be sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for our other features that pop up during the week. We usually do focused episodes on particular aspects of ocean shipping about two, three times a week. Uh, we'll be kicking back up our series on world maritime history that I'm teaching. Got a little bit off track there, but we'll be back up and running here soon. Spring break this week at Campbell University coming up. Uh, and we'll also be continuing our series on U.S. military sea lift. Uh, if you enjoy the channel, hey, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You get that super thanks button down below where you can contribute to directly to the page or head on over to Patreon. You'll see a link at the very end of the video and in the show notes where you can become a monthly or yearly subscriber. But regardless, I appreciate all of you 
watching this video and making what's going on with shipping what it is today. Over 7,200, uh, 72,000 subscribers. Uh, that elusive 100,000 subscribers is out there in the future. Hopefully for the channel, we'll see. Uh, if not, I'm gonna keep trucking right along as long as people are watching the videos. I'm happy with this. And hopefully you are too. I just appreciate having a great fan base and a uh, subscription base that watches this channel on a routine and regular basis. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.